I also want to mention to all of you that this recording is available to all of you after the program. So I probably will just send a link to our YouTube channel to all of you because I think it's somewhat of a complicated program and you'll probably want to see it again. So we are very lucky, fortunate to have with us today Ellen Brown, who is the author of The Web of Debt, a Public Banking Solution, and her latest Banking on the People, Democratizing Money in the Digital Age. She is also the founder of the Public Banking Institute, and uh, she helped educate many people about uh, the pluses of creating public banks. She developed her research uh, skills as an attorney practicing civil litigation in Los Angeles and is an advocate for financial reform, most prominently as a pro proponent of public banking. Her opinion pieces have been published in many newspapers, including the New York Times, the Huffington Post, where she has a column, and others. And I have to say, Ellen's expertise in financing, money, and banking is second to none. Uh, she is a longtime friend of Praxis Peace Institute and has spoken at many of our events and conferences. And in fact, in the 2009 conference that we had in Sonoma, this is where the Public Banking Institute actually got its start. So we're very proud today to be able to welcome Ellen back, who is a longtime friend of ours. So welcome, Ellen. Uh, thanks, Georgia. <laughs> yeah, and it was in 2010 when uh, it. Uh, you held a conference in Sonoma that uh, all the money reform people got together and we decided we met over over a meal and decided it was about time that we'd done enough talking about public banking, it was about time to do something. So we started the Public Banking Institute. And all that began just, you know, 10, 11 years ago. So now I'm gonna allow you to share the, I'm sharing the screen with you so you can bring your PowerPoint up onto the screen here. Okay, it says dis disabled. Uh, I'm not sure why that would be. I've allowed participants to share the screen. Mm. Okay, I got it. Oh, good. There we go. Okay. Great. All right, so I'm going to speak on a financial reset for the people. You might have heard of the World Economic Forum's proposal for a financial reset. The problem is it leaves out the people, which is us. So we do need something. Wait, wait, oh. Ellen, can you make it full screen for your slides? Okay. I think you, you skipped to the last slide, Ellen. Really? I'm on the first slide. You are now, but it went to the last momentarily. Yeah. I'm just looking where to make it full slip screen. I seem to be there myself. Yeah, I don't quite see where it is. Oh, I know. I can I can make it as uh, sorry. Screw up. Right, slideshow from beginning. Okay. All right. So I'm going to be speaking on financial reset for the people, something we clearly need right now. Um, we've got over 100,000 businesses have been closed, many or most of them maybe permanently, millions of people unemployed. State and local governments are broke because they don't have taxes coming in, obviously, and their costs have gone up with the COVID costs and unemployment, et cetera. We have more civil unrest than I've ever seen in my lifetime. And we have debt way up in individuals, companies, governments are all in debt. Uh, so historically, when they talk about resets, they're talking about a currency reset. It typically happens when we're heavily in debt. So you can see on this chart, uh, 1790, that was um, Right after the Revolutionary War, we were obviously in debt. We owed money and gold to France, which we didn't have. So Alexander Hamilton came out with a, his whole new monetary system, which was a reset at the time. And then um, and you can see here the Civil War. Let me see if I can get this thing to point. Oh, yeah. So the Civil War, uh, when in order to fight the war, 
Lincoln was going to have to pay 30% uh, interest to the British bankers, which was outrageous. So instead, they did a new currency reset where he issued greenbacks, US notes, and actually doubled the money supply with greenbacks. And uh, we had the National Banking Acts then, which set up the national banking system. And then you can't really tell right here, but in 1912, or 19, I think it was 1907, there was a, a banking crisis, a, not, not like a global debt crisis, but there was a banking crisis and that precipitated the Federal Reserve, which was founded in 1913. And then obviously World War I was another big debt issue. And uh, <clears throat> then we had the Great Depression with a financial reset in the form of uh, Roosevelt taking the dollar off the gold standard. So it totally changed our financial um, mechanism. And then uh, at the end of World War II, we, in 1944, we had the, um, uh, sorry, I forgot the name, you know, the, what am I thinking, the global, Bretton Woods. Bretton Woods, yes, sorry, Bretton Woods, where uh, the dollar, uh, the gold and the dollar became the global reserve currency, because supposedly the dollars could be traded for gold. We had all the more gold than anyone else that Roosevelt only took the dollar off the gold standard domestically. But that only held until the Vietnam War, which drove us up into debt again. And de Gaulle in France tried to, or he did cash in all his dollars for gold, which took a huge amount of our gold. And then the UK tried to do the same thing. And so Nixon said, sorry, <laughs> we're out of gold. And um, and uh, close the gold window. So after that, we had just the dollar as the global reserve currency, actually the petrodollar. Nixon and Kissinger made a deal with the OPEC countries that they would sell their oil only in dollars. And um, that maintained the dollar until 2000 when um, uh, Saddam Hussein started selling his oil in other currencies. And then we had Sorry, just do that. Um, and then we had uh, in 2000, we had the dot com crisis, and that was followed by the securitization, et cetera, and uh, the housing crisis. And so we had 2008, 2009, where we had our currency reset in the form of quantitative easing from the Federal Reserve and near zero interest rates for the banks. And uh, despite all that, we still had another crisis in 2019. I and mean, obviously we have a debt crisis right now due to the whole COVID situation. But in 2019, we, we already had, the banks were already in crisis. Um, <clears throat> in September of 2019, the repo market, the repo interest rate went to 10%. It was normally like very low and suddenly it shot up. And the repo market was where the banks were getting most of their liquidity. So uh, the Federal Reserve changed the rules again in March to um, open up their discount window at 0.25% interest for all banks in good standing. So they didn't have to borrow at the repo market anymore. The, the Fed basically said, come one, come all, <laughs> invited any bank in good standing to, or any depository bank to go right to the discount window, which used to carry a stigma because it was at a penalty rate, but now it's the best, best rate in town. In fact, even Chase Bank is borrowing there, although Chase has more liquidity than any other bank in the country, but it's just such a good deal that they're going there. So typically resets mean financial resets, but what the World Economic Forum has come out with is covers everything. The World Economic Forum is the, the those 3,000 business and political leaders who meet in Davos, Switzerland every year. And this year in January, which they're actually having their meeting virtually, they're not meeting in person, but that they are saying that they'll be talking about this great reset. And you can tell from their website that they've planned this out for a long time. I mean, they're not just covering money. They're covering every detail of our lives. And basically, it'll basically be a corporatocracy, a top-down technocracy run by unelected bureaucrats or technocrats. And 
you know, basically technology. Um, Klaus Schwab was the, wrote the book called The Great Reset, and he founded the World Economic Forum. And he is thing, he talks about the fourth industrial revolution and the internet of things. So the first industrial revolution was steam and water power, the second was technology, the third was digital. And now supposedly we're coming into the internet of things where everything will be connected to the cloud, like everything, including us personally uh, and cows and you know anything you can put a barcode on will basically be digitalized. And uh, the IMF has proposed a new Bretton Woods. They didn't exactly say what they had in mind, but one assumes that they are thinking they'll be issuing the global reserve currency. Also, all the central banks are talking about uh, issue or is something like 80% of central banks are planning to come out with digital central bank, digital central bank digital currencies, and the Chinese are already doing it. So they beat us <laughs> to the punch on that. And it, they could arguably, the Chinese could have the global reserve currency because they have this big network of um, the, many countries are already borrowing from the Chinese. They make better deal or they make loans at better deals than the IMF and the World Bank. And they basically come with no strings attached. So it wouldn't be hard for the Chinese with their big Belt and Road project to persuade all these countries, particularly in Africa and Latin America, to take their digital yuan. And if that happened, it could become, if not the global reserve currency, at least a rival, rival currency. But I won't go too far into that. I'm, I've got way more slides than I have time, so I better move along. So that there's a lot of criticism of this great reset. Um, here are some of my favorite quotes. Uh, one man calls it the pharma dollar because now that it's no longer backed by oil, it's basically backed by vaccines and pharmaceuticals in general. If we hold all the patents, they'll have to buy, buy their pharmaceuticals for, from us. Martin Armstrong calls it the elitist coalition to redesign the world. Matt Eric calls it a system of supranational technocratic controls under a baker's dictatorship. Pepe Escobar calls it a technocratic digital dystopia, digital neo-feudalism, algorithm gobbling of politics. And the reason it gobbles up politics is that it leaves out or the way in which it gobbles up politics is that it leaves out democracy and human rights and we don't get to vote on this. These are all bureaucrats that have been appointed or basically appointed themselves, the corporatocracy, the big corporations. So we do need, the, the, Klaus Schwab writes that, you know, this is a great opportunity, that this COVID crisis is a great opportunity to, and we can't let an opportunity go to waste. So it's a great opportunity to change the whole global system. And I would agree, we do need a reset of some sort. There, obviously we had problems with, we've had problems with the big banks and the great divide between rich and poor and that our monetary system perpetuates that. But we need something other than what's being proposed. We need one that actually serves the people. So how can we do that? First, I wanted to go into, I just think this is really interesting. Uh, two competing money systems have vied for dominance for thousands of years. The way the way you learn it in economics class is that it all that the first money systems were barter, like uh, one the farmer with his cow or the farmer with his milk goes to market and trades it for the chickens of another farmer. But the problem is that you might not want eggs. Sorry, trades it for the eggs of another farmer, but you might not want eggs. You might want something else, and so. Gold was became a very fungible medium of exchange. I mean, that's the way you learn it. And then that evolved into metal coins and then paper money and then plastic money and then electronic money and then cryptocurrencies. Um, I'm not gonna go into cryptocurrencies much, but anyway, that's the way it's taught. But Michael Hudson says, no, that the banking system came into historical memory uh, 5,000 years ago, 5,500 years ago, full blown. It was, it already, it was the way it was. So these were the Sumerians and um, they, 
they clearly knew something and got their information from somewhere. They invented the first wheel, they invented the first written language, they the sailboat, the ir irrigation, and the concept of the city. They built quite remarkable cities. Um, and according to their own cuneiform writings, um, they got all this information from the gods. You can figure out, I'll leave it to you to figure it out. I think that's a really interesting question where all this came from. But anyway, according to their writings, we were genetically manipulated as the highest life form they found here to be their serfs because the lower gods, whoever they were, weren't well adapted to our atmosphere and it was just too much work for them. But for us, we could do the work because we're, we're earth beings. So that's what they said in their, in their writings. But their writings originally the original cuneiform was all about accounting and keeping track of who owned what to whom. So that was the original banking system. Uh, the temple was they essentially worked for the temple. So it was the center of the community and then you had these serfs all around and they uh, were supposed to work their land and they gave a certain percentage of their crops to the king every year. But periodically they, wouldn't be able to pay because they might have a bad year, you know, um, crop crops failed or whatever. And so the king and the temple allowed them to pay interest and carry their debt over from year to year. But the interest was quite high. It was 30% for a thousand years. We had 30% interest. And this is a very uh, remarkably sustainable system. But the problem, obviously, if you compound 30%, very long, you'll never you'll never get out of debt. And it did not serve the king and the temple to have all these people in jail for in debtor's prison. So the king would just periodically grant a debt jubilee. And that was Michael Hudson wrote a book on this called um, Forgive Them Forgive Them Their Debts. And uh, so that's how they avoided that's how they made this system sustainable that the lender was the government, and the, the government was able to write off the debts periodically as needed. So that, those were the first great resets. And uh, worked for 2,000 years. It's the most sustainable economic system we've ever had. I mean, nothing else has lasted for 2,000 years. And, but how it fell apart, as Michael Hudson writes, is because the lenders became private lenders and they were certainly not willing to just write off the debts periodically. And the, and the king didn't have power, didn't have control over that. And so Rome fell because of debt. And today, that's where we are today. Debt is the new serfdom. We again have private lenders and we can't write off those debts. So instead of debt jubilees, we have the business cycle where you have debt uh, grows until it can't grow anymore, until the debtors can no longer pay or the lenders are just no longer willing to make loans to businesses that it, they don't think are going to be able to pay. And so the whole system collapses and the people who still have some money left or the rich, in other words, uh, buy up all the properties at uh, fire sale prices and the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And that's a syndrome that we've repeated over and over. And we're seeing that right now where the big corporations are buying up. First of all, the small corporations or small businesses are being called non-essential. So the essential businesses, the big, big businesses like Amazon and Walmart are uh, taking over the market and the, the little businesses are being put, put out of business. So the competition is being eliminated. Um, one major systemic flaw in this system is that the money, money is actually, today is actually created by pri private banks as loans. I've talked about this quite a bit before and written about it and you probably are familiar with it, but I'll just go over it quickly. Um, so you can see on this chart, the blue line is the money issued by government, uh, coins and dollar bills. And you can see that's not much. And the red line is uh, the circulating money supply, the money that we actually use to buy and sell that circulates in the economy. And so where did all that come from if it wasn't issued by um, 
by governments. Uh, the Bank of England finally conceded in 2014 after <laughs> they got a lot of pressure, I think, from from positive money. But I wrote about this in 2007. A lot of people have written about it, but it was at that time it was considered, you know, crank conspiracy theory. But now they finally come around and admitted that the the Bank of England said banks do not act simply as intermediaries lending out deposits the savers place with them. Commercial banks actually create money in the form of bank deposits by making new loans. And in fact, they said 97% of the money currently in circulation is, is created in this way by bank deposits. So how they do it is with double entry bookkeeping. So if you were to take out a $500,000 loan, let's say for a mortgage, the bank will write it on one side of its books as a liability to itself because it's going to have to cover that $500,000 check when you write it to your seller, assuming the seller is in another bank. And then they write it as an asset to themselves because you have promised to pay that back uh, with interest. So they say, well, they haven't really created anything. It's just they've just issued credit. And so the bottom line is zero. But if you have several banks doing this, let's say you have two banks and they both make a $500,000 loan and the sellers are in the opposite banks. So each bank will have created $500,000 on its books, which will become a deposit, which will de be deposited in the other bank. So each bank will have $500,000 coming in, $500,000 going out. So their books, it all comes out to zero, the books balance and they don't really have to scramble around and find money anywhere. It just, it all works out. And, but meanwhile, a million dollars has been created that, that the sellers, the two respective sellers can now spend in the economy. It was created by the banks um, just by writing it in their books. So what's wrong with this system? Obviously the, our major issue with it is private bankers are in control. This is a great quote from Robert Hemphill, who is credit manager of the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta in the Great Depression. He said, we are completely dependent on the commercial banks. Someone has to borrow every dollar we have in circulation, cash or credit. If the banks create ample synthetic money, we are prosperous. If not, we starve. So that's one problem. Another problem is mathematical. I know I, get a lot, I always get a lot of pushback on this, but it still looks obvious to me banks only create the principal, they don't create the interest. So there's always more debt owed than money created to pay it off. Debt always grows faster than the real economy. So where are you gonna get that extra money to pay it off? You have to go into debt, more debt. So the debt compounds until finally it grows exponentially and exponential growth, as we all know, it's a pyramid scheme um, exponential growth is unsustainable, so eventually it all collapses, and that's why we have this cycle of booms and butts that we're all familiar with, or that we're experiencing right now, in fact. Um, so we can't do a debt jubilee today like they did in ancient Mesopotamia because the, the lenders are private, and we're not going to persuade them to just write off their debts. So how do we get out of this? Uh, ben Bernanke said, it's easy. We just uh, just print the money, helicopter money. And of course, he was citing um, Milton Friedman, who had said that. Milton Friedman said, we, you just, it's, he said, it's easier, easy to cure a debt deflation where the money supply is shrinking due to debt, where people are paying off their debts, which ex money is created as a debt. It's extinguished when the debt is paid off. So if people are paying off their old debts and they're not taking out new loans, the money supply will shrink and that's, that's a debt deflation. And uh, he said, it's easy to fix that. You just fly over the people and drop money on them. And of course, Ben Bernanke took a lot of grief for that, but, but it, it, that was true. The problem with, so they did quantitative easing, but the problem with quantitative easing is that um, the money doesn't go, it doesn't go to the people, it goes to the banks. That's the way our, um, the Banking Act of 1933, 34, that was written right in there because the bankers protested. They didn't want the, um, well, anyway, the, so they have to go through these primary dealers and then the Fed only issues reserves. It doesn't issue dollars directly and the reserves go to the banks. And so it's still, We've still got these middlemen banks, and if they're not willing to make the loans, 
the money's not going to get into the real economy. And that's where we are right now. They don't want to make loans to the little businesses that are all going under. Um, the criticism of quantitative easing was that, that you're, you're going to uh, drive up prices because you'll just have all this money coming in. But in fact, if you use that money for productive purposes, that's not true. In China, the Chinese money supply grew 1800%, 18 times over 23, over the last 23 years of studying in 1996, I guess. Anyway, maybe 24 years. And, uh, and they did not have inflation. In fact, overall, the inflation rate has gone down. So why not? Because their GDP went up at the same rate. So if you put the money into making stuff uh, as if you've got one dollar chasing one widget the price is going to be one dollar if you've got ten dollars chasing one widget the price is going to go up to ten dollars but if you've got ten dollars chasing ten widgets the price is going to stay at one dollar so if you have goods and services going up at the same rate as the money supply goes up prices remain stable. In fact, you need to get that extra money out there if you want to generate GDP. Um, and we also saw that in the US when uh, Lincoln issued all those greenbacks where he actually issued $450 million of greenbacks, which are treasury issued dollars, doubling the money supply. And it was not inflationary. Even Milton Friedman wrote in his major book that it that it, the, um, there was some inflation, but there's always inflation at wartime because you have shortages and everybody would prefer gold over paper dollars. So gold always does better than paper dollars. But even Milton Friedman said it was not due to increasing the money supply. And after the Civil War, um, we had a period of remarkable productivity, including building the Transcontinental Railroad which generated a 60% profit for the government. Well, you would, you know, they could cost them nothing if they just printed the money, but they got a really nice return on it. And with that infrastructure and other infrastructure, they managed to tie the country together. Very productive, and it was one of our most productive periods in history. And you can see from this chart that there was, that was not a period of significant inflation. The inflation level, stayed the inflation rate stayed pretty level until um well on this chart it really shoots up around 19 in the 1990s and that was when um when we had all this liberalization financialization derivatives securitization all the, that change in the money system um, another thing about the chinese is that they're big savers so when they got this extra money they didn't rush out and spend it, they saved it. So they're, they're, instead of consumer spending going up, it went down and their savings went up. And in the US, our savings rate is very low. So you can assume if you gave people money, let's say you gave them a monthly dividend of some sort, um, most people would not rush out and spend it. They, if they, all these people that, only have $500 or don't even have $500 for an emergency. They're going to, they need some emergency money. They're either going to save it and, or invest it, but they're not going to rush out and put it into consumer goods, except for those essentials that maybe they didn't have the money for. But once they've got those covered, you can assume they too, like the Chinese are going to save it. Um, our household debt is very high and if you pay down your debts, again, money is created as a loan, it's extinguished when the loan is paid off. So if you gave people, let's say you gave them $1,000 a month and they were required to pay their consumer debts with it, you wouldn't have to make them pay their mortgage with it because that's gonna take all of it. <laughs> but, but if they you know, had to pay down their credit card debt and those ones that are really killing them anyway with interest rates, that, that money would not go into competing for goods and services. It would actually be extinguished. It would actually shrink the money out there. So here's a chart there by one researcher who showed that 80% of Americans must borrow just to meet expenses. 
and the amount that it would take to fill the gap between real disposable income and the cost of living is about $1,250 a month. So let's say you gave people a national dividend of some sort, universal basic income of $1,250 a month. Um, most of those people would save it or pay down their debts. And the few who don't have debts probably wouldn't spend it either because those are the rich who don't need this extra money for, for their, their regular needs. So they would probably save it as well or invest it. So it's still not gonna be competing in the consumer market. So I would argue that just like the Chinese, we can afford um, a universal basic income now, one, I've argued for that for years, but now the World Economic Forum that unfortunately the Great Reset people have captured that and the threat is that they'll be using it as a bludgeon against us, meaning that if, uh, you know, once they wiped out the businesses, so we can't earn any extra money. But well, first of, first of all, let me say, uh, people think that this would make make people lazy, but you can't really live very comfortably on $1,250 a month, particularly if you have a family. So people are gonna want more than that. So they will still go out and work. This is just like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's like the first rung in Maslow's hierarchy of needs that you take care of their food and shelter. And or you know even then it's gonna be pretty sparse shelter, maybe a room somewhere, you can rent a room somewhere for $500. <laughs> um, and, but people are gonna want more than that. So they'll still be working. Um, so my argument is we could, we could afford many things. We could afford a national dividend uh, that, and that it would not be inflationary and we could print money for many other things like infrastructure, saving the environment. And some of this is controversial, I know, but I don't have time to <laughs> even give my opinion on it. Medicare for all, et cetera. But we, I think were that system to be used, we want to insist that it's with not, there are no strings attached. It's just like social security. You get it no matter what, or just like a dividend on your stocks. Nobody asks you if you've been good before you get your dividend, you get it anyway. Uh, so what we really don't want the Chinese system of social credit, because it's too totalitarian. It's what the, one thing that the US is particularly known for is our Bill of Rights and our Constitution, uh, all those freedoms that are very important <laughs> to, to all of us. Like we grew up with that, that that's, that's our country and that's our, those are inalienable rights, which means that they're rights that we have because we're human and all humans have those rights. So we don't wanna give that up. But we could use, we could capitalize on the Chinese system of creating, just creating money on the books, which is what they do. For example, they built 12,000 miles of high speed rail in a decade. And how did they do that? They just, they own the big banks, they own a big infrastructure bank. So they can just issue the money on their books, like all banks do. And then the fees from the, the trains uh, pay back the loan or a dam you know, that generates electricity and the fees again can pay off the loan. <clears throat> and the Chinese uh, don't put debtors into bankruptcy. They don't put their, or they haven't, I guess they're starting to do it. But anyway, they, they just call them non-performing loans and they just carry, carry them on the books. They don't put the banks into bankruptcy, which they own anyway, so why would they? And they don't uh, put the put the businesses that, that are, can't pay their debts or the individuals, they just carry them as non-performing loans. So we, we could do that as well if we had a public system. In other words, if like with the um, Sumerians, the government or the, you know, that was a religious government theocracy, but anyway, that if the community collectively uh, issued the money and issued the credit, and issued the debts and could then write off the debts. Um, <clears throat> so well, Roosevelt did something very similar to what the Chinese do, which was he set up the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, <laughs> tried to get the Federal Reserve 
to set up all these uh, industrial banks that would fund productivity, but he couldn't get that passed. So instead they used something that was set up by Hoover, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, that was really set up to save the banks. But the way Roosevelt used it was they generated <laughs> funds of credit and then they used that credit to um, basically rebuild the country. Any kind of loan that was what's called self-funding, meaning uh, if it would pay back, like even farms or whatever, small businesses, if, if they could pay the money back, they, they would get these loans that, at very, very low rates. And with that um, Reconstruction Finance Corporation, over the 25 years that it was in operation, it basically rebuilt the country and not even in a shoddy way, but like if you go into the, here, if you go into the the railway station. I mean, there's still all this beautiful artwork up in the uh, up on the walls or in the post offices that used to have this beautiful artwork. I mean, they they had money to fund special things like art artistic things, and we could do that too. We've got the talent, we've got the you know the ability to perform these services, and we've got um, the resources. But what we're lacking is the money and the money could just be issued if it's done in the right way. Uh, so over the course, oh, also the Reconstruction Finance Corporation funded uh, the US participation in World War II. And oh, with all that, it actually turned a profit for the government. Not only did the government not have to pay for any of this, but they actually made a profit on it. Um, and so, oh, sorry, I should have said, but there's a bill right now that uh, HR 6422, which is the National Infrastructure Bank, Bank bill, which would um, mimic the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. And I think that's a great idea for right now. Uh, clearly we need a ton, trillions of dollars of infrastructure, and this would be a way to do it the way Roosevelt did it. Uh, but if we can't get Congress to act, we can, still do something similar on a local level, and these are uh, public banks, people's banks. Globally, 25% of banks are publicly owned. Um, China is the big one, but uh, many Asian countries have strong public banking systems, and then Germany has a very strong public banking system, et cetera. I mean, most countries have at least postal banks. Uh, <clears throat> In the US, we only have one, <laughs> so you probably already know this, but that's the Bank of North Dakota. Um, I started writing about it in late 2008 because I knew that North Dakota is the only state that had its own bank, so I was watching it, and it turned out it was the only bank, only state that escaped the credit crisis. They, they were the only state, by, by spring of 2009, they were the only state that had never gone in the red. They had the lowest unemployment rate in the country, the lowest default rate, the lowest foreclosure rate. Uh, and last year was their 100th um, birthday, the centennial. It was formed in 1919 by a populist movement when the farmers were losing their farms to out-of-state bankers, big banks, and they knew that there was something wrong here. So they got together, formed a political party called the Nonpartisan League, and got got their bank passed and so they got a public state-owned bank and a state-owned greenery both of which are still there and the bank of north dakota is doing brilliantly well according to the wall street journal in 2014 the bank of north dakota is more profitable than goldman sachs and jp morgan chase i mean how could they do that um the argument then was that it was due to oil but oil has really tanked since then and uh, in the state itself actually tapped up the, the Bank of North Dakota for an extra dividend when it was struggling because it wasn't getting the income from, from the oil revenues. Uh, but still the Bank of North Dakota is just year after year is reporting these amazing returns. So why is that if it's not due to oil? I would argue, we argue it's uh, it's their business model. So they don't have, they've cut out the, the pricey middlemen, basically no private shareholders sucking out the profits, no bonuses, fees or commissions. They don't have a $20 million CEO. They don't have to advertise because they actually partner with the local banks. 
and the local bank sort of, it's the local bank that finds the customer and then comes to the Bank of North Dakota for help if they need help with liquidity or capital or um, regulatory requirements, et cetera. And so they don't have to advertise for uh, borrowers, but they also don't have to advertise for customer or depositors because they, do, they basically just have one depositor and that's the state. And by law, all of the state's revenues are deposited in the bank. Uh, and right now in 2021, or to, to, in 2020 particularly, uh, or the rules were changed in 2020. So it's a really good time right now to set up a public bank, assuming, assuming we can manage to get a master account with the Fed, uh, because the Fed has eliminated the reserve requirement. They totally, it means you don't, technically you don't have to hold any deposits. Uh, of course you do because you have to cover your your liquidity for withdrawals, but the, but you don't have to keep 10% in reserve with the Fed. Um, banks can borrow now from the Fed's discount window at 0.25% as I described before. And um, with no reserve requirement, I, I st I'm not exactly sure what that means, but uh, there was an article in Forbes that said, until further notice, banks need not hold any reserve against their assets, meaning their loans. This means that banks could theoretically continue making loans to infinity. Um, of course, you're limited by your capital requirement. So I can't even see the top there because some. Uh, so here are some suggested solutions I, that this great reset that they're proposing, we probably are going all digital. We're probably, or, well, we want to insist on maintaining our cash or at least some form of digital arrangement that is like cash. And there are such things. The one I like is called Hol Holochain. It's peer-to-peer um, -peer digital trade. So, so it's a digital system, like you could still do it on your phone where you and another phone would interact but it doesn't go to a central system. It's just, um, it's, I, I don't even want to try to explain cryptocurrencies, but anyway, there are such things. They're developing things that are cash-like in the cryptocurrency space. And you could also use cryptocurrencies for as community currencies, which is what basically what Holochain is. Um, so there, so we probably are going to get Fed accounts or the um, digital currency from the Federal Reserve since they've been talking about it and everybody's working on it. And in fact, if the Chinese do it, I suppose we have to do it just to, to compete. Um, but people don't really trust the Fed. I'd rather see a, a digital greenback than a Fed greenback or a Fed dollar, Fed digital dollar, because the greenbacks are issued by, by the treasury, which is under the control of Congress. But anyway, there are possibilities. So I always like, I think of the, the movie, The Hunger Games, where the people were, you know, was basically a feudal system captured by technology and the heroine and the heroes captured, recaptured the technology and used it for, in the service of the public. And that's what I think we need to do. We're, whatever system they're gonna set up, we have to make sure that it's designed to serve the people. The, those are actually quite interesting tools, but we wanna make sure that, that we still have our basic constitutional and civil rights um, built into them. So these are my three books on this subject. And um, for more information, my website's at ellenbrow.com and publicbankinginstitute.org. We've got lots of information there and that's all I have. Thank you, Ellen. Uh, do you want, want to shop? I will stop uh, sharing the screen now. Uh, at least I think I will. John, are you there? I am. Um, she can do it from her end, or you can go to, um, you should see on the top of your screen, Ellen, uh, uh, a bar that if you move your mouse up to the top of the screen, you should be able to click stop share. It'll be a red button. My screen still shows. <clears throat> The PowerPoint. 
Yeah, I'll figure it out. Go ahead. Keep going. Okay, uh, it should be at the top of the screen. If you just move your mouse up to the top of the screen, a little bar should pop down um, that says. Oh, uh, I see. I see. Yes. Okay. And then you can click stop share. Okay. Okay. There you go. <laughs> Good. Okay. Okay, we're back in real life. All right, now what I'm going to ask everyone to do, because I know there are going to be questions, um, is everyone keep mute until you're called on to ask a question. And I hope that all of you know how to put your hand up, um, the automatic hand up that, um, on your screen. Does everyone know how to do that? Uh, if you don't, John, do you want to just tell people in case people don't know? Yeah, how? so you go to the participants window. Um, that's on the main Zoom screen where you see all the faces. You can click on participants. It should open a window up on the right over your chat. And then you can basically just click raise hands and that'll retain position. So whoever raises hand first can get called on first, that type of thing. Okay, so John will be watching whose hands are going up so that we can um, we can uh, feel the calls. Uh, before we begin, I wanted to ask one thing of you, Ellen, uh, because someone asked me about it. What do you know about the countries that are starting to stockpile gold and why they are doing this? Germany has been pulling money back from their foreign banks and China also. Do you know anything about that and why that might be happening? Um, well, gold is considered, I mean, everybody's concerned about what's happening in the global economy right now. And, you, you know, at one point, was it Germany that tried to pull the gold out of our central bank? And we said, sorry, we don't have it. So we want to make sure they get it and get their hands on it. Uh, the, the Chinese digital currency is not backed by gold, but I know there was discussion that gold could be a global reserve currency. In other words, something you trade with other central banks trade with each other. They haven't really decided what the, the new... Um, Bretton Woods global currency is going to be, but that, that could be it. But anyway, I can see why they all want to get their gold in their own hands. They don't want it somewhere overseas where they don't know what's going on. So that's still seen as a valuable cur possible currency or just commodity of some kind. Yeah, of course, you know, Bitcoin just went to $40,000, which is unbelievable. What do you think the future of that is, Bitcoin? Um, well, I did write on it and I've researched it quite a bit and Bitcoin itself could not be a national currency. It's too expensive, too, uh, too slow to do the number of transactions that are conducted in dollars and people don't even trade it really as a, they don't really use it as a, to trade. They use it as a storage of value. But it's just like gold. You don't really trade your gold either. You just hang on to it because you feel, figure at some point it's going to be worth more and you can sell it for that. So that's really what it is now pretty much as a speculative thing. I know there's this lightning system that supposedly make, will make it so that you can buy things in Bitcoin more easily. Um, but it also has bugs, I understand. And there is the possibility, or right now, Bitcoin is really the reserve currency for the other cryptocurrencies because uh, you can't really buy anything in, um, companies can issue their own cryptocurrency, you know, which is uh, basically issuing your own money. And then uh, whoever holds the coins, these crypto coins can then buy your products with those coins, but there's no market for these coins. So you've got to, you've got to, first trade them for Bitcoin if you actually want to use them, you know, to buy something on the regular market. So. Okay. Thank you, Ellen. Uh, we're going to go to Philip Beard now and next will be Clifford. Sorry, Stuart was first. Um, okay, Stuart. I don't know if, oh, he, he took his hand down. Sorry. Never mind. Okay. So, Philip. Okay. Can you hear me? Am I unmuted? Uh, you need to be a little bit louder. Uh, how's this? A little bit yeah, better. I can hear you. Okay, okay good. Um, Ellen, great to see you again, and it's wonderful to be reminded of all the uh, wonderful research that you've done and the answers that you've come up with to uh, serious, awful problems that we face. I remain skeptical about one thing that gets far too little attention in the books that I've read about the, money, the monetary system and the economy in general and how to fix things, and that is the, the interest Thing. You, among all of these different authors that I've read, including 
uh, Ellen, including um, Naomi Klein and Thomas Piketty and so forth, they, they talk about the need to uh, change the economic system and the way money is distributed, but they don't talk about the fatal flaw that I, I see it as a fatal flaw in any event that you bring up, but namely the fact that all money or practically all money is, tre is created as debt and the money to pay the interest on that debt is itself not created. Now, just logically, that is not sustainable. And yet very few, well, as far as I know, you are the only one of the commentators on all of these problems and, and uh, alleged solutions that uh, recognizes that we can't continue to, to uh, issue money that way. So anyway, I'm wondering, first of all, what you know about the Yak Bank in Sweden, which is uh, which issues money uh, or distributes money. I'm not sure if they I don't think they're a depository bank, but uh, in any event, they uh, operate um, providing uh, loans to their members at no interest. And they've got an interesting way for financing that. But I don't uh, don't know if it would be applicable to the situation in the United States. And if you have any insight into that, I'd like to hear about it. And secondly, uh, what kind of thing must we do if we if we establish our public banks? I still see a danger for those banks if they're going to be issuing money like other banks do as loans at interest. Is there some way that we can limit the amount of interest that they'll be charging? And the fact that the interest that is being paid back on those loans will will revert into the um, into the bank's own or into the state's own operating fund or or tax base does that take care of the interest problem i think i've asked enough now and I hope you yeah know. well those are excellent pro excellent questions you know the um there's the islamic banking which is interest free but they've never really figured it out either i mean they what they do is they basically if you pay cash now, it costs five hundred thousand dollars. If you if you spread it out over thirty years, the cost of the house is a million dollars. You know, they just they just um, get collect in that way. I mean, you do it. The bank has to cover its costs, and you can you can see that issue. And I actually think interest serves some useful purposes. Like if you don't have interest as a penalty, just like with the Sumerians, if then people just won't pay. They'll say, "Well, I'll pay it next year." You know, I couldn't. I couldn't do it this year, so I'm just going to roll the loan over and pay it next year. And then they'll roll it over again and roll it over again. I mean, what? How are you going to motivate them to try to pay their loans? But certainly, 20 percent or even higher that we're paying on credit cards is way too much. It seems to me we could have a national credit card that would be at you know one or two percent, something very low, and still serve those purposes and uh, and still cover the costs of of actually doing the service um, on Yak Bank funnily enough I actually went to, I was invited to Sweden and they translated my book web of debt and so I spoke there I think in 2011 and I stayed with the guy that founded the Yak Bank but I can't repeat how it worked it was complicated and it sounded to me like it was not real efficient. I know there's another, maybe it's Norway, there's another um, country that is issuing interest-free loans right now, but they're, they're at negative interest rate. You know, the central bank is lending at negative interest rates. So basically the central bank is paying the bank to make these loans. And so they don't have to charge the borrower <laughs> because they're getting their money I mean, they're actually getting paid to make the loans. So that, that's another system altogether. But I've heard from people that understand derivatives better than I do that, that we, can, we can't go negative. We can't go to negative interest rates because it would absolutely kill the derivatives market and which is at, you know, it's at hundreds of billions or I don't, it's huge. I've forgotten the, forgotten the size now of the derivatives market, but it would absolutely destroy the economy if that whole thing came down. And the problem is if you go to negative rates, then both sides of the deal are gonna be losing money. And the way 
bettors bet in the derivatives market is they hedge their bets with, by having a bet on the other side. It's it was very complicated and I didn't really understand, but my guess is we're probably not going to negative interest rates. So those weren't very good answers. But <laughs> I the, the conventional explanation for the debt virus and why that's not true is because of the circulation of money that if as long as it keeps circulating in the in the market that that basically doubles the money you know it's like if two people both spend it that kind of doubles the money supply and that gets enough money out there but i did just looking at the numbers it just seems to me obvious that every, if everybody in the world is in debt at interest you've got to keep increasing the debt to come up with the money to pay the interest yeah, you, you said uh, at one point that in order to pay the interest, people have to take out. Georgia, you're muted. Sorry, I thought I was on yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, No, no, Georgia's <laughs> muted. She's trying to talk. Yeah, Georgia. Yeah. Sorry, I was still muted. Yeah, I was just going to tell you, Philip, that we need to go on to other questions before we could come back to you with, with more questions. I wanted to make one comment that uh, when you were talking about the interest rates and how high they are on credit cards, uh, Bernie Sanders was is trying to get the interest rates lowered so that the ceiling would be 15% instead of 30%. So I don't know how far that's going to go. Maybe now we'll have more of a possibility of getting that done. But this is something important that we could all be uh, lobbying our legislators to to do. Yeah, so, and those are those are private interest rates. So a public bank can go a right. lot lower than that because we have a lot. Yeah. So. Yeah. Bank of North Dakota makes 2% infrastructure or infrastructure loans and um, I'm not sure what rate they're at now for education loans, 5% or something. But anyway, it's less than than the the national banks or the, the national rate. Yeah, I meant credit card uh, interest rates, which are unbelievable. Oh, right. So, yeah. <laughs> right. So I'm going to go. Well, to and in Canada, as soon as the... Um, the crisis hit like last a year ago. They cut the interest rates in half for the banks. Mm -hmm. Cut credit card rates in half, so they can still turn a profit. Obviously, yeah. the banks made out like, well, bank stocks. I guess isn't doing so well. But anyway, the 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 lenders in general, the financial system made out like a bandit in the last year. They should have propped up some of their profits. Okay, so now Clifford. Yes. Um one thing you mentioned uh, was about the possibility of um, having public digital money versus federal digital money. Um, I was wondering to what extent all that would be accomplished if the Fed were nationalized. The possibility of nationalizing the Fed isn't something you mentioned, but I'm just wondering what the advantages would be of that. Because some people say, well, the Fed is a government entity. Um, would nationalizing the Fed make a difference and be equivalent to issuing our own money? And is yeah, it? Yes, well, I, I've written a lot about that we should nationalize, <laughs> should nationalize the bank. But that would be the equivalent of having a digital greenback or a treasury issued. You know, you basically have the treasury and the central bank working together. And there is talk um, that. Um, Anyway, that, that now that, that the Treasury official will be, sorry, Georgia, remind me, what's her name? Oh, Janet Yellen. Yeah, sorry. Janet Yellen, who was the formerly head of the Fed. So they will be working together closely, no doubt. I mean, if the, if, if the uh, Congress said, or if the Treasury said, uh, we're going to issue X amount of bonds and we want you to buy them, and they, they made that deal ahead of time. That's the equivalent of nationalizing the Fed. And that's basically what the Japanese do, even though technically they haven't nationalized their central bank, but they do make deals where the government, or, or, you know, the federal government and the central bank agree that they're going to issue debt and the central bank's going to buy it and return all the interest. Okay. Um, I think Gina was next. Hi. So also, I got to tell you, Georgia, my husband Roy has been sitting here listening to this, too. And so we're <laughs> OK, there's some real heavy noise. Really? 
Well, there was just there for a moment. Your voice is very faint, so you might want to. Okay, I'll speak up then. I'm sitting here in my living room with my laptop on my uh, lap. Um, so my husband is sitting here too in the room. We've both been listening and we're both a little confused about how we get, I mean, the federal government is a currency issuer and state and local governments, of course, aren't. So we're a little confused though how a public bank would work if it's a, a state or local government public bank versus a well, national public bank. And because all of our money is basically issued by banks, if you've got a state bank, which is issuing credit into the local economy, the credits are deposits, which get spent in the local economy. So you stimulate your local economy, increase your tax base. We, you know, you can see in North Dakota that worked very well. It stimulated the whole economy to have their own bank, but uh, agreed that is a, a hang up. And that's why it's so cool that we can now technically borrow from the Fed at virtually virtually it's actually zero to 0 0.25 percent that's the rate so you can basically borrow from the fed for nothing so ideally i would see a a total public system with the fed at the top or the central bank or the money issuer i'd rather call it the treasury like greenbacks you know that that would issue the greenbacks that the local banks would have access to like this basically free credit to um, back their loans with, so for their liquidity. So really the banks would be sort of um, franchises of, the, of this whole public system, but they would have access to this deep pocket of liquidity. That's the thing, the federal government can go into debt till the cows come home because they want to, but states can't. They have to balance their budgets and they don't have that deep pocket. So we should have access to it and we could in a public, you know, if it was a whole system network of public banks. If the whole thing were public and we're working to serve the interests of the people and the, going local is excellent as well, but, but the community currencies generally haven't done very well because they're too, too small, too local and Again, they don't have their own source of liquidity, so you can't you can't make loans in them, for example. But you could if if you had a public system where where the actual banks worked like banks, but they were actually owned by the government or owned by the people collectively. Um, do we have any other questions? I'm looking around and I don't see any hands up. Oh, I'll ask one if no one's got one. Sure, go ahead, John. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering how far you see decentralization making it like, you know, do you ever see banks getting replaced in total? I know you say there's still a place for some government uh, centralized agency issuing the currency, you know, but do you ever see, you know, banking or peer to peer currency being completely decentralized or, or just, you know, further maybe expound on decentralization? Yeah, well, if we went to... Um... There, there are these proposals, which I wrote about in my latest book, Baking on the People, and thought it was a great idea, except now it's been captured. So you get all these experts that are saying, no, it's a terrible thing. They're going to use it to bludgeon us into submission. But anyway, assuming that the um, that everybody had an account, like a Fed account, everybody had an account at the central bank, um, that would basically put the big Wall Street banks out of business because everybody would want their money with the central bank. It, it couldn't fail. It, there would be no more reliable bank than to put your money with the Fed. And um, if they paid interest like they did up until a year or so ago, if they actually paid interest on the reserves, which is what, you know, only right now, only banks bank with the Fed. But if we also got to bank with the Fed and we got the same interest rate they did, and if there was it used to be like 2% or 2.5%, two then everybody would want to bank there. They pull their money out of the Wall Street banks and the Wall Street banks just wouldn't have any liquidity. And that may arguably be why the Federal Reserve opened up its discount window to all comers at virtually nothing. So they, they would have some access to liquidity. But yeah, it would be, would be quite possible to drive them out of business depending on how you set, set up this whole system. Very interesting. Do we have any other questions? 
And I could ask could, Hollow oh, Chain oh. is, uh, I'll just say, Hollow Chain is, uh, I researched all these different cryptocurrencies, and the only one that I thought really could work is a national system that was that actually gave us the benefits of cash, like peer-to-peer -peer trade, was the Hollow Chain system. And Did you could set up all your community currencies on that. And you know you'd be trading basically just within your community, but anyway, it's it's all possible. I th I mean I think technocracy technology is a good thing. It's just that we want to make sure that it doesn't capture us. We want to capture it. <laughs> we want to use it for public purposes. If we're well on the way to possibly having a state public bank in California, and do you want to say anything about that, uh, Ellen? Yeah, well, there was a bill AB 310, which was uh, withdrawn last year, and um, it would have turned the infrastructure bank into a depository bank. So right now we have an infrastructure, it's called the California Infrastructure and Development Bank. It, uh, last time I looked, it had $300 million as a loan fund, and it lends out these loans at, I think, 3%, which is considered very good loan or very good rate for the businesses that it's lending to. So it's got 20 times as much demand for these loans as it has money. But if you took that 300 million and turned that into capital at a 10% capital requirement, you could have 3 billion in um, loans that you could make based on that that pool of money that they've got in there. So that was our original infrastructure bill, which was several years ago, or sorry, Last year. original bill to turn the infrastructure bank into a state owned, a depository bank. If you're a depository bank, you have the ability to leverage. So you can leverage your funds at 10 times what, what you can get out of them now. And obviously if you lent 10 times as much at 3%, you're gonna have 30% in profit. You'll, you will have costs and you'll have to pay for your liquidity and all that stuff. But still, it's it was a profitable venture. Definitely would save money for the infrastructure bank and make money for, or make many more loans for the local community, stimulate local community. But the, the AB 310 kind of overreached and the treasurer and the and the controller both objected. And so that's why they withdrawn it. And I think it, it, it's postulated that 10% of the, um, the treasurer's investment pool would go in, be deposited in the bank. This is where the government, the state government puts their extra funds and have done over many years. It's got a hundred million, billion, no wait. Yes, a hundred billion dollars in it. <laughs> it's a huge fund. And but and so they were asking for ten billion dollars, you know, to capitalize the bank. Well, that's what uh, that's what the treasurer and the controller didn't agree with. Plus, plus they had a there were a lot of other provisions that I think were very controversial. So they're they're redoing it in there. But in principle, both the treasurer and the controller have expressed their support for a public bank. So. If they if they could all work together well, we could come up with a nice piece of sausage the way <laughs> the way you know legislation is made after you get everybody's input. Yeah, and they're still planning to uh, resubmit yeah, that year. as they rewrite it, and then it will come back to the assembly. So uh, Cheryl would like to speak next. Yes, um, I would like to know your thoughts about why the stock market is so disconnected from the economy. I mean, right now the stock market is just booming despite the fact that our economy is in shambles. Mm -hmm. um, so if you could speak to that, I would be very interested. Yeah, well, there were the $3 trillion that, um, that was in the original um, stimulus package last year. And that money, of course, everybody got $1,000, the, but that was not much, uh, that was a very small percentage of that packet. And most of it went to big businesses, but particularly the Fed has always been considered the backstop of the stock market. And the, it's called the Fed put, you know, the presumption is that the Fed will always step in and save us. And that's what they did in this case. There was that $454 billion that, that was part of that bill that were used to capitalize all these uh, special purpose vehicles 
at 10%. So you could make $4 trillion worth of loans theoretically out of that. And uh, those were supposed to go to buy bonds, uh, corporate bonds. They, they weren't used much. The special purpose vehicles were barely used, but the Fed itself or Jerome Powell acknowledged that the whole point was it was really PR, you know, to let this, the, the investors know everything's okay. We've got your back. You know, we can buy these bonds if you don't buy them. I mean, one of the, one of the special purpose vehicles was to buy uh, state bonds, but the interest rate was so high that, that the states didn't use it. Where we all need money, but nobody went to those special purpose vehicles except I think maybe Illinois and the New York Transit or something. Anyway, generally nobody borrowed there because the rates were too high, but that's what happened. You probably saw Mnuchin ask for the money back. <laughs> Got not as much as they should have returned, but anyway, because they weren't used, but it looked good to the investors. It was like, okay, the Fed has their backs. So they continued to buy these corporate bonds and corporate stocks, et cetera. Plus, you know, that the rich, the rich get richer in these in these situations. It's just it's the usual boom and bust thing where they're buying up all the properties cheap and they could corner the market because all the little businesses have been shut down. If you if your competitors have put out a business, you've got the big companies like Tesla, of course, is doing ridiculously well. Not that they've sold very many cars. It's I think it's probably their satellites that are the big draw. Anyway, you've got and Amazon, I mean, <laughs> Amazon is just running circles around everyone else for obvious reasons. They've been given the keys to the kingdom. It's like nobody else gets to even stay in business or even little companies that maybe could have don't have the ability to do online sales like that and deliver them. So they, they just can't compete. Nobody compete, can compete with Amazon in a climate where all the businesses are shut down and you're not even allowed to go shopping. So except online. So anyway, we've got that. It's a Do you see any point? Rich. And might I add that there's the pharmaceutical industry, which is all, all those vaccine companies are just booming. And even gold has done very well. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, given what you're describing, do you see any ultimate stop to that? I mean, where do you see ultimately this going? Um, good question. Anybody else have any opinion on that? I mean, I, I don't know, actually. I, I, I don't even know where this whole year is going. I, I wouldn't really want to predict. I mean, hopefully, I actually put my faith in astrology, <laughs> right? <laughs> The dawning of the age of Aquarius. Supposedly, we've got the forces behind us now, and I hope that's true. And in which case, you know, all will be well. But if we're, if it's just us our, on our own steam, I don't really know how we're going to pull this off. I could throw out my ideas all day long, but it's very difficult to get politicians to act on these things. I think we're going to just take one last question because we're running out of time. So uh, I see Lori has your hand up. Do you want to ask your question? Yes, um, Ellen, I think I'm going back to this um, 40,000 Bitcoin. We can't, we're supposed to have the dollars rising on gold, but we've never gotten above 2000. Uh, the same thing with silver. I mean, it, you know, I just find this very strange. Okay. And, you know, the, the fact that we do have Janet Yellen coming, coming in, you know, as, as part of the new federal aspect. But I really feel that with the state of California, the size and the economy that we have, that we could be right there in the uh, same area of uh, the Bank of North Dakota. And I really don't understand why we can't get this message forward. And pandemic has only sent it back further, but legislators are gonna be active because they're gonna be looking for remedies for all of the businesses that are currently out and actually funding new businesses because they need the stimulus in the economy. Yeah, well, we actually have quite a few states that are going, um, 
like gangbusters toward the toward their state owned banks and their locally owned banks. We got Matt, we just had a conference call this morning. So we got Massachusetts, New York, um, New Jersey, and California. Those are the strongest. There were some others, but I've forgotten. Anyway, I mean, I think every people are looking for answers. The problem is the startup cost. If you get over the capitalization, that's what they always say. Where are we going to find the money for this capital? Because they don't have any spare change sitting around, but they really do. But uh, the, the number one problem is finding somebody to design a, a business plan. In California, I think it's two hundred fifty thousand dollars for Gary Finley, who's considered the ex, you know, the state expert. And the East Bay people have come up, or they they have retained him, although I don't think they've come up with all the money yet. Anyway, that's. The first thing you have to do is to prove these show these legislators that this is going to work and why it works. And for that, you need a good business plan. And that means you need somebody who knows where all the bodies are buried, you know, who understands the where the money is in the government. So you need an insider to do your business plan to, to find where these pools of money are. I know uh, in uh, Bob Hasegawa, who is did the first state-owned bank model in, he was in, in uh, 2010, like he, they were the first, they were before we even founded the, uh, the um, Public Banking Institute, and uh, they're still working at it. But he says, you know, that he's been a legislator for that long, and he said that there's nickels and dimes in, the, you know, buried in the couch all over the place in the government, but but you've got to be able to see in there. So like I couldn't design a business plan because I don't know where all those nickels and dimes are, but you need somebody who is who knows and who's willing to do it and who has the credibility to persuade the whoever's gonna charter your your bank that you know that he knows what he's doing and that he's right. Great. Well, I think that will conclude the program today. This has been really in depth. So I know many of you will probably want to see it again. We have recorded it and I will send the link to all of you on this call. If for some reason you don't get it by Monday, let me know because uh, all of you can get the recording of it. And of course you, Ellen, will get it right away as soon as, as, soon as I get it up on our channel. Um, and I want to thank you so much, Ellen, for doing this. This has just been really important for all of us to hear. So, yeah, you can all unmute yourselves and we can clap. <laughs> thank you, Ellen. Uh, thanks. Well, it's thank great you. to see you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Georgia, for hosting. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And um, I've saved the chat. And if you know how to save the chat, please do that also. I will have it. Oh, I didn't know.